You're listening to Investigation Insiders by Integris Intelligence. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Investigation Insiders. This is Farhad. I hope you are all well and safe. Um, Before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to give a special thanks to Assistant Director in Charge of the FBI's New York office, uh, Mike Driscoll for his service and friendship. Um, as many of you may know, he's actually retiring and moving on to the next phase of his career. So best of luck with that, Mike. Um, thank you for everything that you've done. And also welcome aboard to the new uh, assistant director, James Smith. I don't know him personally, but want to wish him the best of luck. Uh, so back to the show, we have another amazing guest, uh, an an attorney, a former prosecutor, a retired FBI agent, TV personality, problem solver, and probably most important, an amazing dad to five, uh, Richard Frankel. How are you, Rich? Very good, Fran. Thanks for having me. And and I I completely agree with you. Mike Driscoll was was an amazing assistant director in charge, a, a great FBI agent. And it's a it's a loss for the FBI, but uh, but you know he did his time and he did it he did it exceptionally well. Um, and also welcome to the new uh, assistant director in charge. Um, yeah, th- no, for sure, I I agree with everything, and um, I guess this is how things go. Uh, so Rich and I uh, met through our mutual friends at TNM USA several years ago. We've had a chance to work together on a few things, and I've always admired. Rich's ability to get stuff done while maintaining his uh, sense of humor and general positive outlook on life. Um, So, Rich, perhaps um, you can start by giving our audience an overview of your career. Sure. I, this will only take two or three hours, so um, if you're, you're ready to go, no, no. I'll give you, I'll give you the uh, the abridged version. Um, uh, like you said, I was a uh, 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 a, a, an assistant district attorney in Suffolk County. Um, I did that for about five years. It was great. Um, uh, fantastic people out there. Uh, you know, um, during my time out there, I actually worked with the current uh, district attorney, Ray Tierney, and many members of his staff. Um, and it was just, uh, um, just a lot of fun working with guys and gals, you know, your own age, uh, who are all about the mission of protecting Suffolk County. Um, during that time, however, uh, you know, there was an attack on the World Trade Center, the first attack in 1993, and I had always thought about joining the FBI. So after that attack, uh, I actually began my process of uh, getting into the FBI. Uh, it took a while, just like for everyone, and I joined the FBI in 1995, went to the academy. Um, also, by the way, I, I really enjoyed the academy. Uh, and uh, when I was done, uh, you can end up anywhere in the United States. And with my luck and my accent, I had uh, no choice but to return to New York. And uh, that's where I came back to. Uh, for the first five years, I uh, worked on organized crime uh, on the Gambino squad, did some uh, uh, good cases with some really, really good investigators, uh, you know, um, the, when I joined uh, the Gambino squad, they had already taken down John Gotti, uh, and so you had these uh, these agents who had, you know, were at the pinnacle of their career, and that's who was able to, you know, train me at least, you know, uh, those years, um, and uh, um, it was great working with them. I was also able to work with some first grade detectives from NYPD doing some cold cases, and again, it was just perfect for me. Uh, learning how um, to do the investigation side of law enforcement, um, you know, in in that FBI and New York uh, style. So I did that, and um, uh, you know, at, at one point, um, you know, I, I was moving up a little bit. Uh, I was an attorney for the bureau. However, 9/11 occurred, and like a lot of agents on uh, uh, in the New York office, I moved over to uh, the national security side of the FBI. And that's basically where I stayed um, during my time uh, in New York. Uh, I was promoted up uh, during uh, that time, and um, you know I, I, I did some foreign travel for the FBI. 
Uh, I was in Afghanistan, Haiti, uh, did some time in Africa, but basically continued to move up uh, throughout uh, my career in the FBI, both in uh, New York and in Washington, D.C. Um, at one point, I was promoted to the um, uh, interim uh, SAC in Buffalo. I returned to New York as the SAC of the Joint Terrorism Task Force. I moved over to the criminal division of the FBI as the special agent in charge. And then uh, my last position in the FBI was as the special agent in charge of the Newark division, uh, where again, um, you know, I hadn't really thought much of the Newark division. Uh, it just, you know, it's not something you think about when you're in the New York office, but uh, Newark was great, uh, it, it, um, fantastic investigators. And uh, to be quite frank, it had, you know, had a lot of crime. It had uh, violent crime, it had national security issues, it had counterintelligence, counterterrorism. Uh, it, it, it really was a great office to um, uh, end my career in with the FBI. Yeah, uh, and and since since you've left the bureau, I, I mean, uh, you you've been helping, I guess, private clients with with issues that arise uh, from time to time and around the globe, right? That's correct. So I, I've worked for several companies, and I'm now uh, um, I have my own company um uh rmf crisis management and and the reason it's crisis management is because really uh you know we don't focus in one area but really if there's any issues any quote unquote crisis or critical incidents that our client um would have uh we get involved and it could be anything from a cyber issue uh to uh maybe they're 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 selling their company and they want to know who they're selling to it could be that they are being targeted by uh, bad individuals, you know, by criminals or just by people who are unethical. And um, these clients would like me to assist them in how to deal with both the clients. And if they need to engage with the government, um, I assist them engaging with uh, different um, uh, levels of government, whether it's uh, uh, local, state or federal, um, or even at times we've engaged uh, you know, through our foreign partners uh, with foreign governments. Sure. Yeah. And no, I, I mean, uh, Rich is definitely has a, has a good resume and, and done a lot of pretty amazing things. So let's get back to you, the person. So where'd you grow up? And I think you already got into how you become, became an FBI agent, right? The inspiration from the 93 attacks. Yeah, you know, I, I, I grew up in uh, Port Washington, where I'm still based. Uh, my office is in Port Washington. Um, and, uh, you know, went to uh, uh, all the schools here, you know, the elementary, uh, at that time, junior high school and high school. And uh, it's, a, it's a great location. Other than uh, traffic, um, I love Long Island. Um, you know, you have, uh, you know, you have the water, uh, you have a lot of different activities. And um, it's actually been a great place to uh uh, to raise my children um, uh, since I since I have uh, you know returned here um, during my FBI career and have continued to stay here after my FBI career um, and then uh, you know joining the FBI you know I, I had thought of being an FBI agent when I was probably like you know six seven eight nine you know you see the FBI on TV or you see a couple of the old movies on TV yeah. and you know I thought it was really cool um, but, uh, you know, uh, at, at that time, you know, it could be anything. And, you know, I also wanted to be a baseball player and I also wanted to be, uh, uh, Batman. Um, well, you know, I couldn't be Batman cause I don't look good in tights. Um, I couldn't be a baseball player because I suck. So really the only thing left for me was an FBI agent if I wanted to follow my dreams. Ah, I got you. But you are a good runner though, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm a good runner, uh, which is, uh, uh, an oxymoron if you've actually seen my physique. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, it's uh, it's funny because I played a lot of sports. I played, you know, uh, um, sports in school. I actually was a phys ed major in college. And, uh, you know, I've played um, a lot of the one-off sports, I like to say. I was a rugby player. I was a, I was on the crew team. I was a wrestler. Probably wrestling most of my, was most of my career, um, even though I wasn't the best. But uh, what I found out when I was trying to lose weight to make the lightweight crew team in college yeah. is, that I was actually a better runner probably than I was anything else, but I actually liked the other sports more. Well, that that's pretty awesome. I actually learned this weekend that there is a professional tag league, by the way. So you can actually be a professional 
tag player, if you're still good at running and can still run fast, I mean, that's still an option for you, Rich. Yeah, but that uh, I've actually watched that, by the way, and oh, you have yeah. to be able to run sideways and jump over things. And uh, <laughs> right now, uh, I'll just say I'm very linear. You know, I got you put me on the road and send me in a direction and I can go in that direction. Uh, <laughs> you, you make me want to cut left or right and I may pop a knee. I got you. I got, all right. Fair, fair enough. Uh, so obviously the FBI has played a major role in your life and your career, right? Um, what do you remember most about being an FBI agent? Uh, the people. Um, I, I, I loved being an FBI agent. Um, because I was with these people in the FBI, um, you know, that uh, I, I did not meet before the FBI and I haven't met after the FBI. And, and I think it was because we were all about the mission. You know, we, we, we all love the FBI, but it's more about the, the people. And, um, you know, it's funny when people leave the FBI, you know, you'll talk to them three, four years later and you go, um, do you miss it? And I think... 90% of the people or even higher will say, you know, I don't miss this. Uh, I miss the clowns, but I don't miss the circus. In other words, you yep. miss all the people, you miss it that we had fun together. You miss it that we were about the mission. You, you, listen, uh, you know, if I called somebody at two o'clock in the morning and said, we have to get in a car, travel 400 miles and sit on a surveillance for the next, you know, 24 hours. I don't think anyone would say no. Yep. You know, it was all about the work and, and working together. Yep, yep. No, for sure. So you 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 talked about a lot. You talked about your time uh, in New York and in Newark, overseas, all that sort of stuff. So what 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 are some of the things that stick out, or times, or experiences that stick out in your mind about your time with the bureau? So yeah, I mean, you know, I break it down into into pieces because you know that's just the the best way for me to remember and the organized crime days um with the gambino squad were, were great um i mean there are investigators there that are still literally they are still with the gambino squad um mm -hmm. since 1997 they're still doing that and they're they are excellent uh in, in what they do um and they're they're tenacious uh they, it doesn't stop them you know these are multi-year investigations and they can keep their head in the game and still go after those uh those individuals who you know are trying to get over whether it's uh through um racketeering uh or through other scams that you know uh, uh you know the the mobsters will do um then you know when i went to national security I, it was almost a calling for a lot of people and for myself i must say where you know, 9-11 occurred and our goal was to make sure this never happened again in the United States. It's always to catch the bad, the bad actors, you know, to, to get to catch the terrorists. And, and we were focused on that. But it was also um, being very proactive, doing what we can to see that this would never happen uh, in any manner. And, and we had several cases where we were able to do that. Um, you know, uh, it was both in the, um, uh, you know, we, we had uh, these individuals who uh, uh, were going to try to blow up a uh, plane uh, taking off from um, uh, Stewart Air Force Base and also blow up some synagogues. We were able to uh, um, put a sting in on that and stop them from, from hurting or maiming, killing anyone. Uh, there was another case um, where, uh, you know, you had uh, these individuals um, who uh, tried to blow up the New York City subway. Um, the Zazi case, uh, and uh, being proactive, we were able to stop them from doing that and then arrest uh, all the actors here in the U.S. Uh, you have um, the Times Square uh, attack where, where there, you know, the individual was kind of successful because he was able to light the fuse, but for various reasons, um, uh, the, the, the bomb did not go off, uh, and we were able to catch him within 53 hours and then learn everything about his case over the next few weeks. So there, there are those great cases. And then overseas, um, you know, going and working with uh, uh, people in, in Africa because of the attacks that have occurred in Africa, you know, the, the um, attack on the rugby club during the World Cup in Uganda, and then the, the um, terrible attack on the Westgate Mall in Kenya, where I think it was either 60 or 70 children were, were killed and numerous other individuals were killed during that attack. So, um, you know, just knowing that I was able to work on those cases uh, was, was something that um, uh, really, uh, you know, 
it's something that I'll never forget. Yeah, I mean that, that's that's a lot that you just went through right there. Um, so you know, our, our our audience sort of loves anecdotes and stories, and so do you have one that you want to elaborate on that sort of helps encap uh, encapsulate your time with with the FBI? Sure. I'll, how about uh, I'll give you one organized crime and and one terrorism one. Sure. Uh, the the organized crime and, and by the way, the organized crime one was not me. Uh, this was one, uh, I was on the Gambino squad, and it was just a fabulous case by an individual. Um, you know, I, I can't use his name because he's been in many cases. I'll just call him Joe. Um, so Joe was an agent. Uh, he was going after some individuals in Brooklyn. And, you know, it was just a, um, uh, you know, it, it, he, he was really on the case by himself. And he had to figure out how to do it. So he actually, on his own, um, uh, while using an FBI undercover, you know, we're able to use uh, these undercovers that we that we make during our time in the FBI. He basically went into a bar in this covert capacity and um, just started to get to know everyone in the bar. The bar was actually operated by a uh, or run by a Gambino um, uh, capo. And during that time, uh, he got to know people in the bar. He would go in once a week, maybe once every two weeks. He would bring in another agent, a female agent, who would be his girlfriend once in a while. And he just got to know people in the bar. And he, they asked what he did. And he said he's a computer guy because he'd done, you know, he'd worked on computers, you know, before he was in the FBI. So it was a great cover. And during that time, you know, okay, it's Joe, the, the computer guy. And, you know, over time, they got to know him. At one point, the capo, in the family comes up to him and says, hey, my PDA, if you remember the personal digital assistance that you know we carried back then, um, it's not working. Can you can you fix this? And because he basically gave it to this, you know, to, to Joe, um, you, you don't need a warrant or anything because it was handed over. So right. uh, Joe was able to take it back, get the PDA working right away and was able to actually download the information in there, uh, which had um, quite a bit of evidence uh, related to racketeering and load and sharking. Based upon that, you know, um, we uh, Joe was able to get a warrant and a search warrant, and we went back to the bar this time overtly, uh, and we all went in and and basically, you know, arrested a few people in the bar, and we we had the um, uh, you know the capo in the back room, and we're talking to him, and he you know trying to get him to cooperate, and he won't cooperate, and at one point. Joe walks into the back room. The capo stands up and says, whoa, 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 this guy's not part of this. He's, you know, he's a civilian. You know, he's not, he's not, you know, part of what we do here. And uh, at that point, Joe pulls out his creds and uh, his badge and tells the, uh, uh, the uh, Gambino capo that he's an FBI agent and that he's been working on the case the entire time. <laughs> the, the, the capo almost passed out. <laughs> you know, we actually had to, you know, put him in his chair and, and uh, you know, it, it didn't flip him. You know, it, did, it didn't change anything. But just seeing that, you know, it was just an unbelievable experience for me, you know, watching, you know, one of my squad mates um, do that. It's, it, you know, you, you see it in the movies, but then seeing it in person was unbelievable. Um, yeah. So that, that was the organized crime case. The other case, um, you know, I, I can go in. You know, it, it could be we could talk about this for an entire show by itself, but it's the Westgate Mall attack mm -hmm. and the Westgate Mall attack was an attack in Africa um, where when we first heard about it, all we heard was that a mall is under attack in Kenya by a terrorist. And within about an hour, a couple hours, um, you hear that the mall has collapsed, you know, internally. So uh, we're assuming that. They blew bombs up or something, and you know we 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 have no idea how many people were involved or anything like that. But we understand that there was an American um, who was injured or killed during it. That's what we're hearing. So that gives us the authority to at least ask the Kenyans if we can, you know, assist them in this, you know, attack. And this Westgate Mall was a high-end mall, and and actually there were other countries where people from I believe it was uh, Canada. London and uh, Germany were also attacked. And so I believe they're also asking, you know, if they can assist at the same time. It takes a while, but during this time, we start putting together a team. And in, in the end, we actually flew over there with about 80 um, FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force 
uh, personnel. So that included, you know, people from other agencies, NYPD, uh, the state troopers, uh, HSI, um, you know, DHS, and then the FBI. And we also flew over with people from our headquarters. And, and the team that we sent there were um, investigators. They were uh, members of our, um, uh, you know, SWAT team and hostage rescue team to provide protection. There were um, uh, other in, um, investigators who are our evidence recovery uh, personnel. Uh, we brought analysts with us. We had basically, we, we put together a, a, um, uh, a mini office that we flew over there on a 747. And, um, you know, working with our legal attache there, uh, who was able to get us uh, access and authorization from both the Kenyans and our embassy, because we have to be allowed in by both, uh, mm -hmm. to fly in there and, and, and uh, see if we can help the Kenyans. Um, we, we, it, it, we flew over there, it took us about 18 hours, um, and we landed in Kenya in the middle of the night and realized that we didn't have the right, right you know, uh, equipment to actually unload our plane. So we unloaded basically a 747 by hand. You know, everyone just jumped in and uh, through the night we unloaded uh, the, um, the plane um, and then, uh, you know, moved everything we could to our forward operating locations. We set up a, uh, a, um, an office in Kenya in a garage uh, that was uh, um, owned by the, by, you, you know, the U.S. government. And we basically worked out of this garage for the next month. Um, and during this time, you know, we, again, um, uh, working on behalf of the Kenyans, you know, we're, we're actually there to assist them. We're not there to, to lead the investigation or take anything over, but working with the Kenyans um, and the Brits and the Germans, I believe the Israelis were there and also the Canadians, um, we were able to basically put together a, um, uh, a team that went in and a team of investigators that, that started investigating the actual attack, but also an evidence recovery and evidence response team that went into the mall and actually collected all the evidence that was in there. And, you know, working with the, uh, with the host country, the, the Kenyan uh, anti-terrorism teams, um, you know, we were able to then find out who actually committed the crimes, in other words, committed the act of terrorism, it was four individuals, you know, when we first started because of how many people died, um, we thought that we're, there were, um, there might've been, you know, 15, 20, 25 attackers, but in the end there were only four attackers uh, and one other ind individual who got away, um, who was basically, I guess, you know, their, their uh, communications guy. And we were able through that communications guy and evidence found at the, at the Westgate Mall to actually locate and identify other, uh, um, terrorists who were involved in this case and working with the Kenyans, the Kenyans were able to arrest them and they brought them to justice. Um, and again, you know, we did this in 53 days working in a, 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 a um, an environment, to be honest, we were not used to, uh, working with the embassy and working with our, um, with our partners. Uh, but it was really a, a great investigation. And there, the, both of those stories open up a, a ton of questions, but we got to get to the show. I just want to ask you two questions, right? Um, first, related to um, uh, the arrest in, inside the bar, right? Mm -hmm. So, it, like, from an FBI agent's standpoint, right, what's the most exciting, button? and I, I realize how this is an unfair question, but, like, what's the most exciting part of that? Is it is it watching the case develop? Is it finding what you need or is it making the arrest? But what, what's most exciting? Well, the most exciting is probably making the arrest. The most fulfilling is probably the middle one, which is seeing everything come together, yeah. you know, and actually being able to go to the U.S. attorney and get a, uh, a complaint or an indictment, you know, because that means that you've done your job, that you, that you know, all the investigation is going to come to is going to come to that final thing, which is actually the most exciting, um, which is is arresting that person. But, yeah. you know, if you're undercover, you know, during that time, you, you know, even though, you know, this guy, you know, it wasn't in a, um, a a real bad location. He's walking into a bar where he's got no friends. Right. And I'm sure during that time for him, it was a uh, it was a um, uh, heightened uh, excitement level during the entire time that he did that case. Right, right, right. Yeah. 
No, I, I, I can I can definitely see that. Um, and then uh, regarding uh, uh, the uh, Kenya case is um, is what is the feeling on that plane like going over? What like what's the mood like? What are people talking about? What does it feel like? Or is it? I mean, because you guys had been so just used to doing this sort of thing that it was a normal days of work day of work. It's more than that because, you know, um, actually, you know, we'd gone to Uganda a few years, you know, a couple of years earlier. So we still were in that. We had that mental, you know, thing. So, you know, but before that, probably the last time we had done anything like that might have been before, um, uh, you know, in this in this level was before the uh, World Trade Center came down. And that was when uh, the attack on the uh, on the embassies in Africa. Yeah. You know, so, so, you know, the the it was a. I wouldn't call it a tense mood. It was um, an apprehensive mood in that, you know, we don't know what's going to happen when we land, but it's also an exciting mood because this is, hey, listen, we joined the FBI to do this type of thing, to go after, you know, terrorists around the world and bring them to justice. So, you know, and, and by the way, anyone who's on that plane volunteer, you know, to, to go. So this is something that we want to do. So apprehensive, but exciting, exciting. Um, but also ups and downs because it's 18 hours. I mean, you know, yeah. that's a long time on a plane. Um, and uh, but but again, once we landed, it was all business. Yeah. Turn, yeah. you know, we turned from everything to it's like you know, okay, we can't unload the plane. Well, that's not going to work. So how do we unload the plane? Let's get it done. Okay, we got to go to the next stop. Where are we going to go? Then we got to go figure out who's um, who's going to be where. You know, and, and people started breaking up into teams, and it was almost like we were back in the United States doing any case because right. everyone knew their job. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's a really, I mean, again, I, I think we talk about that for a long time, but um, I appreciate you sharing those two stories, and um, I, I, I'm sure our everyone listening will be very interested and in, in listening and learning more about it, but um, so. The the you know the inspiration for today's show actually came. We we actually wrote a Joe Morrow actually wrote an article recently about uh, AI powered scams. And then um, I sort of uh, sourced something where you were speaking about it. And you know I've been wanting to do a show about it anyway. And so so it all came together. But interestingly. Uh, I'm not sure if you planned it this way or not, but you know the the story about the mobster handing over his uh, PDA is almost like a early version of a cyber breach, right? Um, one that was controlled by the individual, and it's it's kind of funny, even though it's been many, 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 many years since that happened, right? And that seems so basic. There are actually, I mean that's still happening today right as people are actually just turning their own information over unwittingly so um i guess let's let's talk about like when you started your law enforcement career right what type of scams were you seeing um just in general yeah you know it's um it, it was it was the beginning I, you know actually if we go back to my fbi you know at the academy yeah. we first class to actually do what they called electronic communications through email hmm. you know, and through you know through a computer the class after me was the first class to actually get a laptop computer so that was you know where we were um and then you make it out into the into the real world and it you know you're really not seeing those type of crimes you know what we're seeing was um remember the nigerian emails yes yeah, yes that's what we're seeing you know the, the Nigerian emails um, are, um, uh, you know, are are, are everywhere, um, yeah. and, and also, you know, at that point we're putting together like a cyber, you know, people in the FBI, um, you know, because only certain people have that, you know, knowledge and expertise to even think about doing cyber, right? You know, and 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 the bad guys are just beginning to do that, but yeah, the the, the Nigerian email was the worst scam and i mean they were very in depth you know there was one there was also the black i don't know if you ever heard about this the black oil the black gold scam which when i was working on it 
I everything about it, and I can't even remember the the salient facts to be quite frank. But I'm right. sitting there going, "This is real. This is real. We got to do this. You know, people are going to get ripped off millions." And I sent it to somebody who knew something about it. And they go, "Scam." <laughs> yeah, it, it, straight out scam. I'm like, are you 100 percent sure you go scam? And it was. It was a scam. Yeah, I'll tell you. And and again, scams uh, like they they reason why they're successful is that they focus on people's inherent vulnerabilities, right? Which often goes back to money and making money quick. But um, so talk about artificial intelligence, right? What are your overall general feelings on it? Good, bad, and ugly. So, you know, there people think for one that artificial intelligence is everything in all encompassing. I don't think we're there yet. Okay. To be quite frank, it's coming. Um, but you know, it's funny, some of these scams that we hear about, you know, people will say it's AI and I've talked to some cyber experts and they go, it's not AI. It, it's, it's, it's definitely cyber. It's definitely, um, uh, going to hurt you, but it's more like an algorithm and the algorithm, um, uh, is, is what you're dealing with. However, when the algorithm can actually learn from itself, that's where we're starting to get into AI. And I think we're starting to see that more and more. Um, I, I am personally, um, I would say I'm not a fan of AI without regulation because right now it, it can be used for anything. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, I think chat GPT is, is a great tool, but it's also something that can, um, harm people and it actually can harm the user if you don't you know how to use it correctly right. so I, I i think we're you know almost at the baby stage you sure. know uh, or, or we're at the crawling stage of um uh, of ai and if we don't you know work it the right way it can go it can go terribly wrong for us sure yeah and then we're starting to see that a little bit so so what are you seeing today with people uh, with how people and companies are being scammed through the use of AI. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, what what we're seeing is you, you'll. Um, it used to be, let's say, it, it, we'll use an example of um, phishing. You know, where you'll get all these emails. Uh, there'll be an email uh, or text uh, sent out to you know a hundred thousand people, and it'll say, "Hey, how are you? Um, I haven't talked to you in a while. Uh, click on this, and and you know, it will bring you to my uh, my my web page." Right. Yeah. And and if you click on it, OK, you, you're now connected to um, a bad guy and they're in your computer. So that's right. the way it, it's been. And then spear phishing is more directed, you know, where it's not going out to the hundred thousand people. It's going out to, to a particular class of people. And it may actually even be more directed to like just CEOs of companies or CFOs right. of company. And it may be something where you if you click on that you think that you're talking to your CEO, you know, you think you're talking to somebody in your company, but you're really not. Where I think we're at now is that is getting much more specific. They're able to use that AI to actually mimic your, how you either speak or how you type. Yes. And using that, they're able to then really almost um, trick you into thinking you're speaking to a known person. And it's yes. not, even spear phishing anymore now it's 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 targeted phishing i don't even know what you'd call it but it's it's where you're really going after that particular um person um and and there may be a reason you are uh, the person may be the ceo or the cfo of a of a small or mid-sized company um it may be somebody that you know has bank accounts and uh, has been doing online transactions somehow you're able to figure that out um it, you're you know it, it's it's the cyber um uh, uh criminals who are now using the ai to go after you um and and, and so you'll see that in 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 business spear phishing the other way we're seeing it is through um ransoms and uh this has become something that's um really changed over the last few years um you know when i was in the bureau uh, I got a call from somebody saying, um, hey, uh, this well, you know, this high net worth individual, his grandson um, was in, is in Canada and got into a major accident. It's his fault. He's not only in an accident, but he's been arrested by the, by the locals in Canada, by, you know, by the, the um, uh, Royal Mounted Police, and they need to get bail money and to get money up there for the hospital. 
and can you help us? And I said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll do our best. You know, maybe we'll go through the legal attache. You know, we'll, we'll see what we can do. And it was a scam. You know, it was somebody who had called in, and and it, you know, the the um, uh, the grandson um, was fine, but he was just somehow they knew that the grandson was not available, and therefore uh, they tried to trick these you know this high net worth um, individuals. Yeah. So that's how it was back in the day. Now you you what they'll do is they'll actually have they'll 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 somehow connect to the um to the grandson or to the granddaughter or to the person that they want to mimic and they'll find that person online through social media and just like you know now I'm online so you can hear my voice you right. know that person will be on online yeah. and they'll be able to take that voice and yeah. put it into an algorithm and then use that algorithm to actually go in and and type in um, a a statement. So what they'll do is they they'll call um, the 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 target. You know this. You know the, let's just say this high net worth individual and say, hey, your son or your daughter or your grandson or granddaughter was just arrested. Um, if you want them to get out, we can do so, but we have to do this quick because we can do it for fifty thousand dollar bail. But if he goes in overnight, then it's going to take a week to get him out, and it may be two hundred fifty thousand dollars bail by the time that happens, because he'll have to go before a different judge. You know, they'll give a whole story to that, and the, and then you know the 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 person who is um, who they've called the high net worth individual may say, "I want to speak to them," and they'll actually start typing in, you know, whatever they want this um, quote unquote person to say. Yeah. And, and it will be a full statement, and you'll be able to actually have a conversation right. between the, the the fake person and the grandparents, and the grandparents now will really think it happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 crazy. Um, you you know, my wife actually, I'm gonna say like last year got a call, and it, it was like a child on the other end just yelling like mom, right? And yeah. she, uh unwittingly says my son's name like is this so and so is yeah. this so and so right and the person hangs up right two minutes later someone calls back and they're like now they know his name right and so it's like a person saying hey uh we have uh so and so here and he's uh gotten into an accident and they started getting into um you know, a, a want, right? Exactly yeah. what you're describing. And so my wife fortunately listens to me here and there and, yeah. and you know, this kind of stuff that we've talked about before. If it doesn't feel right, don't do anything without at least let's let's have a conversation and then go from there. So fortunately she hung up, but she recalled how like real it was. I mean, she was actually crying by the time she was still and then something clicked in her head and she said, Oh, this is well, you know, BS. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it's 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 crazy, and and you're right. I mean, it's it's definitely on a trajectory upwards, right? Um, so I guess it'd be helpful if you could talk about how people can protect themselves from these types of scams. Yeah, you know, it's 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 hard to protect yourself ahead of time. You know, it just it, it, to be quite frank, it really is because somehow they they're going to connect with you, but the when you get the call, it's one, and by the way, I know this is very hard, but it's it's almost to step out of yourself a little bit and 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 be calm and go, okay, um, where are you? Get as much information as you can, right, about it. Right. And then say, okay, I, I you know, you know, I have to call my husband. I have to call this. I have to do this. I have to. I have to see if my bank has the right. You know, has the inform. You know, I can do this with my bank. Whatever it is, that you know, when they hear that, they'll be okay. We'll we'll call you back, or we'll make contact with you, or or go ahead and do that. You know, with your other phone or whatever. And then while you're doing that, what you want to do is you want to make contact with the person who's missing, or who is injured, or who's been arrested. Whoever they're saying that person is as quick as possible, but you also want to see if you can have eyes put on that individual. So making contact may not be enough because if somehow this is a hack, they've already gotten into your computer and they know stuff about you, they may actually have 
somehow got into your phone too. And, and they may be able to somehow um, uh, clone the phone, you know, of, of the person that they're, that you want to call, you know, and so they, somehow they may be able to actually stop, you know, if you call them, you, they may be able to be actually on the other side, yep. if, it, if it's a very good, you know, uh, hacker who, who's involved. So what I would do is, you know, immediately try to find out where that person is and then put eyes on them. Even, you know, if you can do FaceTime, that's good. Or, you know, let's say they're, um, you know, you, you're talking to your son who's in college yep. and you know your, you know, your son's roommate. Call your son's roommate and go, hey, where's, you know, where's my son? Oh, he's, you know, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's in the room. Can you go right now? It's, it's an emergency. I'll tell you after, but I need you to put eyes on him right now. And, and have, you, have the son's roommate say, I'm with him right now. He's sitting right next to me. Now you know it's all a scam. You know? yeah. And then if you can make contact with law enforcement, I get called uh, often with that. And sometimes law enforcement will actually try to get involved in the case and try to you know, um, scam the scammers. So that might be the way to go. But, but you want to you want to do your best right away to find out where the individual is who they who they say is is in a crisis so to speak okay um and then the other thing is i would call law enforcement as soon as you can um especially if you can't put hands on whoever that person is because law enforcement may be able to find your you know your son or daughter quickly or at least give you more information to help you determine whether it's a scam or not. Yep, yep. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's interesting because uh, all of this is reliant on the fact that they know information about you. That's what makes it believable, right? Uh, because they know enough about you to make it seem believable. So just, I agree with you that I, I think that if if someone really is targeting you, uh, the person uh, as an individual, uh, more than likely they're going to be able to come up with information legally, illegally. Obviously, these are criminals anyway, so that they're not worried about that, right? But just one thing I'd add to what Rich said, which I think I think um, uh, is going to help you kind of it, look. These people are also generally trying to. It's a numbers game. They're trying to find victims. They're you know if if they find a hurdle, one hurdle, they'll move on to the next victim is protecting your personal information. And we'll put a we'll put a link in the description of the podcast to an article, the, the article that Joe wrote, which has some tips. But that that's the only thing I would add to what Rich said is you got you gotta protect your personal information to the extent that you you can. And um, that'll help in these people picking up bits and pieces, which makes these sorts of stories believable and then the whole thing about artificial intelligence is digesting and using that information that's that's what's dangerous is in almost like a real manner i think that's one of the issues like take just for example phishing emails right like in the past and tell me if you agree here rich is phishing emails would generally have like you know spelling errors and it wouldn't sound exactly like the appropriate like uh, grammar and you know all that sort of stuff and you know these um, the AI although it's supposed to prevent people from be, being able to create these sorts of things uh, they're creating better well-polished um, you know phishing emails which now uh, you know appear it's not e as easy to spot as it has been in the past what are your what are your thoughts on those things uh, yeah right? no it's, it's become much much harder in fact the, there was um, there was just an FBI uh, um, uh, or DHS um, uh, uh, analytical uh, piece that went out today yep. um, where they're saying there's a certain uh, program that is being used to uh, mask websites, you right. know, and, and you may think you're clicking on Chase. Right. And you're not, you know, and, you know, to be quite honest, it used to be that you could tell pretty easily. Yep. Now, unless, you know, and the way to do it um, is to actually not click on these emails, but then to go and actually type in Chase yourself, yep. you know, and go there. The, the problem with that, though, and, and I've seen this a couple of times, is 
where you think you're you're typing in the right email yep. and you know or i'm sorry the the, the right website yep. and you're one letter off or um you know somehow instead of you know going to the website it brings you to a search engine yep. and now in the search engines sometimes these bad websites are the first or second yep. quick in the in the search engine so it's right. making it so much worse yeah, no, for sure. I, I, I think that, um, again, um, I, we usually end the show with sort of takeaways and, and sort of like points that we take away from this discussion. Um, normally, I let the uh, guests go first, but uh, before I forget this, I, I, I really think this is so important. You know, there is still, I, I think people look at these things as, like it's this complex, like, you know, the, the way that these criminals get this information, do all these, you know, criminal acts, all that sort of stuff. And a lot of times it does boil down to the basics. And the thing I didn't want to forget is that mobster that you talked about that handed over his PDA to someone uh, without really thinking about it, even though that's many years ago and it sounds very very simplified that's a, really what many of us are doing today is handing over our pdas to to in that case it was good actors but in this case for him it was bad but for us bad actors and i just wanted to um just get that point across and and rich uh, sorry about cutting you in line here but what, what would you say if people walked away from this episode, if there's one or two things that you wanted them to walk away with, what would they be? Well, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump on exactly what you said and you know give you an example of that. Um, yeah. If you go on Facebook or name the social media, you know Instagram, whatever, yeah. um, and you go into any of your friends, I bet you'll find numerous ones who are saying right now, "Hey, I'm heading to uh, you know uh, Casablanca. I'm heading to Canada." I'm heading, you know, to the to the Rockies. You know, I'm leaving my house. I'm going here. I'm doing this. They're they're telegraphing everything that they're going to be doing. So right away, or or goodbye to my kid who's going to camp for the next, you know, twelve weeks. You know, actually six weeks, whatever. But right. you know, all that is stuff that the that the bad guy is now going to use if they're going to do this to you. They're going to know that you're in Canada. They're going to know that your son or daughter is at camp. And when they call you, they're going to say, hey, your son or daughter just fell down at camp and we're at the hospital in the town. And yeah. because they know the camp you're at, they are going to, you know, it's now going to sound so much more believable. So right. that's when stop telegraphing everything you're doing. Do it after the fact if you're going to do it. You know, that's what, kind of what I've done once in a while when I, you know, I, I, I may put stuff on social media, but it'll be, hey, I just did this or um, I had a great time last week doing this. At yeah. least, you know, that's over. The the other thing um, uh, re, kind of related to that is if you get the call, be calm. I know it's hard. I, it, I, it, I know I'd be upset, you know. But the calmer you can be, the more thoughtful you'll be. You actually talked about your wife, you know, yep. when she got the call and she was crying and then all of a sudden something clicked and it calmed her down right. and she hung up. Now, she probably wasn't fully calm, but if you're able to think this through calmly, then one, if your kid is in real trouble, it's actually good for that. But it will also let you focus on some of the inconsistencies that are there and you can use those inconsistencies then um, uh, to to realize that this is a scam. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I mean, it like honestly, it almost makes sense on some of these things. Both emails, calls, other sorts of communication is is to almost assume it's a scam until it's proved otherwise, right? Um, and uh, and and kind of go from there. So. 
Uh, all of this is super helpful, Rich. And I, I got to tell you, this was a really enjoyable episode. Um, I enjoyed talking. I, I talked to you anyway about these things. And so it's good to kind of uh, memorialize it with an episode. So I, I really appreciate you coming on. I'm sure our audience is going to enjoy it. And anyone listening that wants to, you know, reach out, we'll, we'll put uh, Rich's sort of contact information in the description. Uh, and Rich, thank you so much uh, for uh, for joining me today. No, listen, thank you very much. Uh, this was really enjoyable. I, I like it where it's just, you know, when we can have a conversation and that's that's what this was. So I think it, you know, it, it, it was really good. And um, uh, again, thank you for having me on. Absolutely. So to everyone listening out there, thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. Continue commenting, liking, uh, following us and sharing the show with, with people that you think that might be interested. And until next time, um, have a good one. Don't forget to follow us. We are on LinkedIn and Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube.